standing for the national anthem. seats. And may I quickly call on Ms. Edward Nyako of GBC to say an opening prayer for us. Please, I'll humbly plead that we stand up as we pray. Father, in Jesus' mighty name, we thank you for this evening's program. Our prayer is that, Lord, your spirit would take absolute control of this atmosphere. And let Jesus Christ alone be glorified. We pray for your wisdom to be brought to bear upon our hearts, that the discourse that we have tonight will lead to the acceleration of the development of our nation. We thank you in Jesus' mighty name for thanksgiving. Amen. Thank you. Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, Ministers of State, media practitioners, good evening and welcome. This evening, His Excellency invites us to have an opportunity to ask of him a few questions after he's given us an update of where he has steered the ship of state to about two years into his administration. We'll start with some comments from His Excellency, and then as we've agreed in collaboration uh, with the Ghana Journalist Association, we'll proceed to the question and answer segment. Please let's welcome the President with a round of applause. <laughs> Mr. Vice President, Chief of Staff, Senior Minister, Ministers of State, ladies and gentlemen, fellow Ghanaians, welcome once again, ladies and gentlemen of the media, to Jubilee House, the seat of our nation's presidency. We almost missed our promised rendezvous of at least two pr press conferences in a year. But we have made it. <laughs> and as the saying goes, better late than never. We've all been busy. I know I've been busy, but not too busy to know that thanks to technology, you're all able to track my activities every day and often in real time. I wonder, therefore, if there's any harm done if we're not able to get around to a formal gathering such as this often. But nonetheless, I'm glad that we're all gathered here as I intend to hold on to my promise. At this time of the year, I should start by wishing all of you a Merry Christmas and a happy and prosperous New Year. So let us get on to the business of our gathering. I'm happy to report that I have paid a working visit to all 10 regions within the year, as I did in my first year, and plan to do every year of my mandate. I like Jubilee House. I fought long and hard to get an office here. <laughs> but I have to admit, it is always invigorating to go out and meet the people in their own communities. Nothing beats seeing and hearing things for yourself. For example, going around the country means that I know at first hand that many of our roads are in a bad state. But that is not a new discovery to me. The distressing deficit in our infrastructure has been a running sore for our country for ages, despite the invisible unprecedented infrastructural developments of yesteryear. 
I know that we need to open up our country, build roads, bridges, airports, railways, and make it easy for the people and goods to move around. This infrastructure deficit poses the biggest challenge in trying to deal with our development needs. I'm glad to be able to report that we have started on a comprehensive program to tackle this problem. Ladies and gentlemen, we are resurrecting the railways. The existing narrow gauge network, which had almost disappeared, and led to a generation of young Ghanaians hardly knowing about railways, is coming alive. Rehabilitation work on the 56 kilometer narrow gauge line from Kujukrum to Takwa through Insuta is nearing completion. This will lead to the restoration of passenger rail services from Takwa to Takradi for the first time since 2007. The freight service from the manganese mine at Insuta to Takradi is in operation, and the ongoing rehabilitation has also led to a spectacular reduction in the number of derailments and incidents that occur on the line. When I went to see the works on the railway lines for myself, I was particularly in touch by the enthusiasm of the workers. The Ghana Railway Company Limited, with its own workforce, started rehabilitation works on the 70.8 kilometer narrow gauge section of the Eastern Railway line from Accra to Nswam and Accra to Tema. They did not have or need any foreign experts, so-called. They had the expertise. And those who did not were ready to learn, and they certainly had enough enthusiasm to carry them through. Rehabilitation of the Achimota to Tema section of the line is approximately 90% complete, and test runs have commenced. Work is ongoing on the Achimota to Accra Central section of the line and the Achimota to Nswam section, and I've been assured that this will be completed before the end of the year. 10 existing passenger coaches have also been refurbished, ready to be pressed into action when commuter services reopen this, on this line. We're not only rehabilitating the old narrow gauge line. I'm happy to report that the procurement process is far advanced to develop a new standard gauge line for the Eastern Railway Line and others to have a network that covers the whole country. A major difficulty, which could slow down the work of this exciting development, is the nuisance posed by encroachers. I want to take this opportunity to appeal again to all citizens to join in and be part of this exciting development and not place any hindrances in the path of bringing modern railways to our country. There is excitement and a lot of activity in the aviation sector. And it is good to know the entry of two new private airlines offering services along the domestic routes. We welcome the competition, as this is already is bringing down the prices for, comp for customers. Terminal 3 at Kotuka International Airport is open for business and attracting a lot of positive comments. I expect that the managers of this facility will maintain it at the highest standards. The airports at Ho and Wa are ready, and we await the commercial flights that have been promised. If the railways and aviation sectors are causing excitement, I can believe I can promise that there will be even greater excitement when work on repairing and building many roads around the country intensifies. Ladies and gentlemen, the Sino-Hydro project is about to take off. The two, this two billion United States dollar barter deal that we have negotiated with China should bring a dramatic and very welcome change to our infrastructure developments, especially in the road sector. The roads that are going to be tackled first under the facility have been enumerated and they should make a great and immediate difference to the lives of many people. The first $650 million worth of projects has been approved by Parliament and are ready for execution. 
It is now up to our professionals who will be supervising and working on the projects to make sure that we get value for money. I'm aware that there is some anxiety among some people that we might be putting ourselves in a position of too much dependency on China. Ladies and gentlemen, for far too long, the lack of money has hampered our development and dampened our self-confidence. I'm determined that we should use what opportunities there are to raise ourselves out of poverty, but there is no chance that I would ever preside over the loss of Ghana's sovereignty to any foreign country. The settlement of our, of our obligation is through the supply of aluminum products to China. We have resisted any attempt to export the raw material for the settlement. That is why we have established the Ghana Integrated Aluminum Development Corporation, a statutory corporation, to take charge of the development of the full value chain of our bauxite resources. The corporation is ready to begin work. Not only is this an innovative way to undertake our infrastructure development, but it also enables us to establish an industry with the metal, which is described as the metal of the future, and which can be a major catalyst for our industrialization. In the almost two years that we've been privileged to run the affairs of our country, everything we have done has been aimed at building a strong economy. A month ago, the Minister for Finance went to Parliament and gave us a candid view of the state of affairs of the economy. He presented a compelling one, and one of hope, but because it is clear that now, as a result of our policies, the fundamentals of our economy are in the right place. The foundation has been laid for the rapid growth and development we expect next year and succeeding years. The 2019 budget focuses on six strategic pillars, entrepreneurship, infrastructure, industrialization, social intervention, agricultural modernization, and improving efficiency in revenue mobilization. Available data up to the end of September 2018 indicates that Ghana's economic health is in good shape. Headline and core inflation generally trended downwards in 2018. Headline inflation dropped to 9.3% in November 2018, down from the 11.8% in 20, December 2017. In real terms, growth of credit to the private sector showed a strong recovery, registering a growth of 6.8% in 20, September 2018, com compared to a contraction of 2.3% in 2017. Interest rates eased downwards in line with the reduction in the monetary policy rate. The interbank weighted average lending rate declined to 4.7% to 16.3% between September 2017 and September 2018. Trend, treasury securities also declined over the period. In other words, the fundamentals are all pointing in the right direction. Even though there is little doubt that salaries and wages continue to be low, an increase in income levels can only come about by the expansion and growth of the economy. And that is exactly what we are working to achieve. I'm confident that there will be welcome news on that front soon. It is also quite clear that when it comes to the expenditure pattern in our public finances, we're not doing that well. Public sector salaries and wages are still taking too large a share, a percentage of our public sector finances. And that is why there's never enough money left for us to finance all the things we need to do. Revenue mobilization is still inadequate. Not enough people are paying taxes or paying at the proper rate, and too much economic activity still takes place without any formal record. The government has put in place many measures to formalize and modernize our economy. It is the fairest and fastest way to achieve what we all aspire to. 
the introduction of the paperless operations at the port, the interoperability of mobile money transactions, the national identity card rollout, e-business registration system, and access to digital financial services are all part of the drive to formalize our economy and enhance its productivity. A critical element is the National Digital Property Addressing System, which aims to generate digital addresses for individuals and commercial properties, and also provide nav navigation capabilities that helps with the ease of finding location. The system has already attained some milestones. There are 1.2 million registered and verified addresses. The system has also recorded 7,787,899 address searches, 11,000 tagged properties, and 20,000 digital address deliveries. I project that we can find addresses without resort to the second turn on the left after the blue kiosk, and that the banks should be able to lend money to the private sector at much lower rates. Verifiable addresses should come with lower interest rates. Ladies and gentlemen, we expect that the digitization process will help ease the problems that come with our land tenure system. And investors can lease and acquire title to lands without the fear of having to litigate in the courts for years over the same piece of land that had been sold allegedly to many other people. Speaking about lands leads me inexorably to the physical state of our lands and water bodies. Last Friday, that high-minded public servant, the world-acclaimed Ghanaian scientist, Professor Kwame Frimpong Boati, chairperson of the Government Interministerial Committee on Small-Scale Mining, announced the measures that government is undertaking to regularize the mining sector and enforce mining laws. He indicated inter alia the circumstances under which the ban on legitimate small-scale mining has been lifted. Let me reiterate clearly here that the ban on galamse, i.e. illegal mining, has not been lifted and will not be lifted. Some of our media collaborators in the fight against Galamse have, in response to this statement, expressed their dismay at what they see as the government having lost the will to fight Galamse. The ban on small scale mining was never intended to be permanent. It was to enable government fashion a policy that will sanitize the sector and ensure that in future, small-scale mining, which has been with us for centuries, will not damage our environment. The measures announced last Friday do exactly that. I cannot and will not give up on the fight to protect our environment. I entreat the media and all well-intentioned Ghanaians to continue to join the fight to protect our lands and water bodies. Ladies and gentlemen, the protection of the environment is uppermost in our considerations as we seek to bring rapid development to the people. 1,000 units of 10-seater water closet institutional toilets with mechanized boreholes are currently under construction around the country. And so are 1,000 community-based limited solar-powered mechanized water systems. Each constituency is getting a minimum of three of these institutional toilets and water systems under the Special Development Initiative and the Development Authorities. I notice that there is room for constituency priority, priority infrastructure needs under which the constituencies pick what they identify as their priority need. I believe there is a lesson in there for all of us by simply taking a look at the diversity of priority needs, community centers, police posts, street lights, culverts, etc., The procurement process will enable every constituency to get one ambulance each in the early part of next year. This will not solve the ambulance problem immediately, 
but it certainly shows more commitment to finding a solution than we've ever seen. Lots of things are happening in the health sector, including the fact that this government has paid up the 1.2 billion arrears we inherited and brought the operations of the NHIS back to life. We're also in the process of launching the world's largest and most advanced medical drone delivery network. The four distribution centers from where the drones will be operating will stock 148 life-saving and essential medical supplies, and not only blood. The drone delivery service will save lives, decrease wastage in the system, guarantee health access for more than 14 million people nationwide, and employ over 200 Ghanaians. This program is not going to be run on the public budget. Corporate social responsibility contributors from private sectors players will pay for the service. I prefer drones delivery, flying to deliver essential medicines to our people than an investment in guinea fowls that allegedly fly off to Burkina Faso without any trace. In all we do, we want to ensure that health officials are well trained, reasonably content with their conditions, and able to practice their professions so we can all have the confidence to entrust our lives into their hands. The prosperity we seek for our people can only be attained when our people are healthy. Ladies and gentlemen, for the first time in many years, there's an abundance of food. And I notice the prices of foodstuffs are low, and in some cases, there's a glut. We're currently exporting plantain to some of our neighbors. Quite a turnaround from when I was lamenting two years ago that we were importing plantains from Cote d'Ivoire. We also did not import a single grain of maize this year. It is not often we have such good news. And it must mean that if you invest in agriculture, you get results. Planting for food and jobs is working. And I look forward to rice joining the, li the list of foodstuffs we're no longer importing. I also look forward to meat and fish becoming abundant under the Rearing for Food and Jobs program and our farmers being rich and satisfied with their lot in life. I encourage all of us to look on farming as the serious business that it is. Radical measures are being taken to establish a solid infrastructure for our agriculture. The imminent availability of significant numbers of tractors and the enhancement of agricultural mechanization centers, the construction of 80 warehouses this year for the storage of surplus food, the revival of the National Food and Buffer Stock Company, and the recent establishment of the Commodities Exchange. All these are being done to modernize and transform Ghanaian agriculture to serve as a major growth goal for the economy. Despite the dramatic decline in the world market prices for cocoa, we maintain the producer price paid to farmers as a sign of our commitment to them. We are on course to realizing the one million ton mark for our cocoa production and seeing to the increasing domestic processing of the product. Our alliance with Cote d'Ivoire to change the dynamics of the global cocoa industry is also on course to enable us the producers and obtain an increasing share of the industry's value chain. It is good news for our farmers. One of the highlights of my year was sitting through a morning of what we call the presidential pitch, where young people who had been trained to turn their entrepreneurial ideas into businesses made presentations. I felt pleased and happy that the future was bright for our country. The entrepreneurial spirit is growing among the youth, and that has to be good. It is also being manifested in the fact that we're paying greater attention to technical and vocational subjects in schools and training institutions, and encouraging those who want to pursue such trades and professions. Free SHS gets all the headlines, but I encourage you to look at all the other interesting dynamic things that are happening in education in our country. Of course, free SHS deserves to get the headlines. We've held our nerves, and Ghanaians have come to accept 
that every child deserves a secondary education. We have not got enough classrooms or desks or laboratories or computers or dormitories. But children once born cannot wait until we get enough Premier Colleges and Holy Childs around the country before they can attend secondary school. In addressing this issue, government with ingenuity and innovation has through the Ghana Education Trust Fund secured a 1.5 billion US dollar facility to help develop infrastructure in our schools. Parliamentary approval has been obtained and the first tranche of this facility will be used to build more classroom blocks and dormitories in our schools to give our schools appropriate facilities to meet the demands of the 21st century. And so we are on double track. And we're building the classrooms and laboratories and gradually turning the once deprived schools into well equipped ones. We're finding, we find that paying attention to the proper management of schools means we're getting better results. The area to show the results really would be when school is over and we see the quality of products that emerge. Would we have the literate, numerate, and well-trained workforce that Ghana needs to be able to compete on the world stage? As we've been making our voices heard on the international stage, some countries are beginning to take a chance on us. It is not every day that Volkswagen, Nissan, and Sinotrack offer to build assembly plants in your country round about the same time. We would have to demonstrate through our expertise, our work culture, and attitude that they have taken the right decision. Systematically, we're also rolling out our one district, one factory policy of industrialization. Thus far, 79 projects have been implemented under 1D1F, with another 35 going through credit appraisal by officials in the Ministry of Trade and Industry and the financial institutions that are supporting the program. Under the stimulus package, 237 million United States dollars have been dispersed to 16 companies, with an additional 35 being considered for support the process of industrialization will be accelerated in the course of 2019. The possible creation of new regions, the first such exercise by democratic constitutional means in our history, has made rapid progress. And in a week's time, voting will take place in the referenda to decide if we should have six new regions. I'm grateful to the people who have put in all the hard work to bring us this far. And I trust that the new leadership of the Electoral Commission will pass well their first test of organizing a free, fair, transparent poll. I pray and expect that the voting will go off peacefully. There can be no excuse for any disturbance or violence. The people who seek new regions are not seeking to secede from Ghana. They are Ghanaian citizens who are seeking new administrative structures to guide their lives by a constitutionally sanctioned process within the Ghanaian space. The Supreme Court has unanimously confirmed and validate, validated the propriety of the process. Let us then leave them in peace to have their day and see whether they can satisfy the high constitutional threshold for the creation of new regions. It is, of course, during times like these that we all realize what a great debt of gratitude we owe to our security services. As the policemen at a roadblock tend to say, when you come across them in the night on your way home from an outing, they are being beaten by mosquitoes so we can be safe. No. I'm not recommending you give money to the policemen, but it is true that they keep us safe. I'm happy that we are gradually being able to give them the tools they require to perform their duties. A few months ago, I presented the police service with 200 new vehicles. The National Fire Service and other agencies are all being stopped. 
The exercise to recruit 4,000 young people to, to the police service is on, so that the increased numbers will make their work easier. The Ghana Armed Forces continue to perform their duty of guarding and protecting the integrity of Ghana. They have been in operations Calm Life, Cow Leg, Halt, and Ahojo to maintain law and order. They've also participated in Operation Vanguard to reduce illegal mining and environmental, environmental degradation, and Operation Roadstar to construct a 40-acre cattle ranch to accommodate some 8,000 cattle at Wawawase, a front place, as part of the measures to stop the perennial nomadic headsman menace. Already, 4,000 cattle are enclosed there. A legislative instrument has passed Parliament that has increased the duration of the service years of the other ranks from 25 to 30 years. Construction is going on to deal with the housing needs of, the arm, of our armed forces. This year, as they have done consistently for more than 40 years, the Ghana Armed Forces has contributed about 2,746 men and women to serve in peacekeeping efforts around the world. I'm glad to see that the proactive measures being taken have helped to reduce the incidence of vigilantism associated with members of the ruling party. I'm determined to stamp it out completely, as well as any other sources of vigilantism that may emerge. I've said that I've been busy, and indeed, apart from going around all 10 regions of Ghana, I've also done quite a bit of traveling around the world to continue with the marketing of our country of war and seeing to the representation of our nation at its important international meetings at the highest level. Quite a number of world, meet, world leaders have also visited Ghana. The German Chancellor Angela Merkel was here. And so was the French President Emmanuel Macron. So was the Emir of Qatar, His Highness Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani. And so was the heir to the British throne, Prince Charles, and his wife, Camilla, the Duchess of Cornwall, and the managing director of the International Monetary Fund, Christine Lagarde, has also paid us this week a visit of encouragement. I believe all these interactions help to illuminate the progress we are making in Ghana. Ghan government has increased the funding for the accountability institutions of our state that is Parliament, the Judiciary, the Office of the Attorney General, SHRAD, and the Auditor General. 2017 witnessed a 12.2% increase in allocations to these five institutions over that of 2016. The financial endowment for the establishment of the Office of Special Prosecutor has also been made. I have no doubt that we will hear from the Special Prosecutor when he is ready. The institution of the Office of the Special Prosecutor does not mean that the Office of the Attorney General no longer functions. Indeed, the prosecutions the Office has initiated in the last year and a half, the Republic versus Stephen Opuni, Sedu Agongo, and Agriculture Limited, the Republic versus Ernest Thompson and others, and the Republic versus Balfour and others, involved the alleged willful loss or theft in the period of the last government of some 556 million CDs. This past year, the Office of the Attorney General has also been busy vigorously defending the state in many civil cases and has won so many cases for government. I suspect the word has gone out that the government of Ghana is no longer the soft touch she was reputed to be. Every case brought against the government will be vigorously defended and the days of easy judgment debts are over. Ladies and gentlemen, we inherited a financial system that was under a considerable state of distress, with banks that were known to be insolvent as far back as 2015, and banks that had been licensed without the requisite capital. Some of these banks were surviving day to day only by virtue of liquidity support from the Bank of Ghana with the underlying problems that plague them 
remaining unresolved. To protect depositors' funds, as well as to prevent contagion from these failed banks to the rest of the financial system, the new administration of the Bank of Ghana took some courageous measures in the public interest to clean up the banking system and to put it on a stronger and more resilient path. There is no doubt that the failure of the seven banks came at the cost of the Ghanaian taxpayer and staff of the affected banks. However, the decisions taken by the Bank of Ghana and the financial support government provided through the establishment and funding of Consolidated Bank Ghana Limited ensured that deposits of more than 1.5 million customers with deposit values of over 10 billion CDs and about 70% of the 5,000 jobs in the affected banks were saved. This was important to alleviate the severe adverse outcomes that could have occurred. It is important that the cost of these interventions, which were borne by taxpayers, are recovered to the extent possible through recoveries from debtors, shareholders, and related and connected parties who took money from the defunct banks. The receivership processes are ongoing, and the receivers are making great strides in their recovery efforts. Amounts in excess of 400 million CDs have so far been recovered by the receivers of the two banks closed last year. The government has set up a special investigations team to undertake criminal investigations into the failures of all seven banks for possible prosecutions by the relevant state agencies. No one found complicit will be spared. The Bank of Ghana is conducting its own internal investigations into the conduct of its officials, past and present, that could have facilitated wrongdoing at these banks. At the same time, the recapitalization efforts by banks have been very successful so far, with about 22 banks already meeting the new minimum capital requirement of 400 million CDs, well in advance of the 31st December deadline. The 22 banks that have met the new requirement include a good number of indigenous banks. A few banks, a few others, are in the final stages of meeting this requirement. I'm confident that at the end of the exercise, we will have a stronger, more resilient banking sector with a strong indigenous presence, well positioned to finance the next phase of our agenda of economic growth. The interest of major oil companies in Ghana has become dramatic. Today, oil companies such as the American giant ExxonMobil and the Norwegian conglomerate ACA have signed petroleum exploration agreements with Ghana. Through the launch of the Ghana Oil and Gas Licensing Rounds 2018, the bidding processes for the allocation of new petroleum rights to prospective investors, the first such exercise in our history. Other global players, such as BP, Knuk Group, and Total have expressed interest in coming to Ghana. We anticipate as a result an increase in crude oil production from the current 200,000 200, barrels per day to 500,000 barrels per day in the medium term and to 1 million barrels per day in the long term. The Ghana National Petroleum Company on its part is conducting a geochemical analysis and will soon start a two-dimensional seismic survey over the northern and southern sectors of the Voltaic Basin. Successful results of this survey will pave the way for exploration and drilling activities to begin. This year is an important one in the economic history of Ghana. We are about to exit at the end of the year from our 17th IMF program since we joined the institution. We're doing so on a good note and expect that the two remaining reviews in April, January and April next year will be completed successfully. The presence here earlier this week of Madame Christine Lagarde, 
the managing director of the IMF, who expressed clearly her support of the current management of the economy, is in this regard a good omen. The most important lesson that we must derive from our IMF experience is that we cannot afford any longer any disarray in our public finances, the reason for our demand for IMF assistance. Government will legislate in this meeting of parliament a fiscal rule that will cap permissible fiscal deficits at a maximum of 5% and a debt to GDP ratio of a maximum of 65%. It is my intention to anchor the implementation of this fiscal rule that will provide stability to our economy by establishing a presidential advisory fiscal council composed of eminent Ghanaian economists who will provide independent advice to the president on how to comply with the fiscal rule. We have everything to gain from discipline in the management of our public finances. It is the foundation for sustainable rapid growth of the economy. As you can see, ladies and gentlemen of the media, a great deal of work is being done in so many areas so that we can turn our back on our recent era of failure and set our country on the path of sustainable, rapid development and growth. I'm excited about the prospects of Ghana, and I invite you to share in this excitement, which will see the Black Star shining brightly again. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mr. President, for those remarks. We will now proceed to the question and answer segment. Mr. President, ahead of tonight's engagement, we have worked closely with the Ghana Journalists Association that has helped us to invite the journalists who are here this evening. And upon arrival, a number of journalists have indicated areas that they would like to question you or interact with you on. About 15 different areas comprising around 70 potential questioners. And we have shared ground rules. We have shared ground rules that suggest that. <laughs> we have shared ground rules that suggest that uh, an individual gets to ask a question as quickly as possible so that uh, you can also have an opportunity to respond. So, Mr. President, we have also spread it out so that at least all the areas can be covered. We will start with the economy, and we're going to do about six questions on the economy. May I please ask you to come? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We're expecting to wrap this up within an hour. By seven. Not yes, sir. By seven. <laughs> By seven p.m., sir. So I'm quickly going to ask you to um, go to the microphone closest to you. Um, for the economy, we're taking about six questions very quickly. Ms. Eduard of GTV. Kweju Echampong of TV Africa. Ms. Aibo Kwansa of the Chronicle. Ms. Kweku Deru, please rise to the microphones. Ms. Kweku Deru of the Kingdom FM. Ms. Yao Che of Ghanaian Times. Cecil Niobudai Wintum of GBC Radio. And the final person is uh, Pilgrim Boache. Please let's be quick with our questions. Yes, sir. Mr. President, you cut a sword at the Marine Drive, expecting that it's going to help create a lot of jobs. What is the progress report so far? Thank you. Mr. President, you've um, given us a very glossy picture of the economy. Um, you said the IMF head was here recently. But my knowledge of the IMF is like um, the owners of football clubs in Europe. The moment they give you the uh, vote of confidence, the next moment you're out. I want to know, uh, you know, the, the, how this glossy feature is going to impact on the Ghanaian because there appears to be a disconnect. We have very good figures in the books, but ordinary Ghanaians are going to Christmas, most of them complaining that 
There's nothing in their pockets. But as, uh, as former president of the Sports Writers Association, I just want to rub this in. We have one district, one factory. What about one district, one sports studio? <laughs> Mr. President, I bring you greetings from the Eastern region. In government quest to mobilize more revenue, how do you ensure that you don't overburden the importers uh, through high import duties, which will trickle down to the ordinary Ghanaian consumer? Thank you. Good evening, Mr. President. My name is Kujie Champong. I report for TV Africa. I would want you to give me your assessment performance of your MPs with respect to the fisheries minister, ministry. Thank you. A few, a few, Mr. President. I want to talk about population that will feed into the economy. So you have recently sorry, said. Sorry, say it again. You want to I do what? talk about population management that population will feed into management. the economy. You have recently said that you want us to be like Japan and the Asian Tigers. And if we compare their population and ours, if you look at the numbers in terms of children between or below the ages of 15, in Ghana, we are talking about 40% of our population. <coughs> and out of this, we are aware that this is not the force within we can derive so much in terms of labor. So I want to ask, what exactly are you going to do? What radical measures you're going to put in place to make sure that as we open our markets, the Nissans, the Volkswagens, as they come in, we have quality human capital that can turn our fortunes around? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. <clears throat> Mr. President, uh, in the past two years, uh, all the economic indicators have been pointing towards the right direction, and you said it yourself. But as my senior colleague said, <coughs> people still don't feel it in their pocket. What is the missing link? And in the next two years, what are we going to see? Thank you. So, Marine Drive. Uh, Marine Drive is uh, a huge development that is being envisaged. And since the time of the sword cutting, efforts have been made to secure the basic agreements that will be able to finance the project. Fortunately for us, the anchor tenant the anchor tenant of the, the Marine Drive project has now been finally established. The exercise of drawing the plans and the architect surveys, all of that is still ongoing. And the time frame within which the completion of the project is being contemplated is something in the area of three years. But the process has begun. And I believe that the Ministry of Culture, Arts and Tourism, who is the main, the lead governmental figure on it, is very much in the middle of monitoring the development and the progress. But developments of that nature are not things that happen overnight. It's a huge, even if you see even the, uh, the, the artist's impression of the final thing, it's a major reconstruction of Accra that is going to take place on that side. It'll happen, fortunately, because, once again, this famous word that uh, some people, I think, find irksome. The fundamentals of our economy are the ones that will attract investors. They know that your economy is stable. They bring their money in today when they're taking their money out in five years, six, seven years, is more or less the same amount of money. That will encourage them to put it in. They bring their money in today, and they can see that within a year or two, that money is going to diminish and shrink because you don't have any discipline in the way in which you run an economy. They won't bring the money in the first place. So we shouldn't snare at this fundamentals of the economy. All the economies, the Asian economies, that have been the lead in the 20th century for transforming themselves from underdevelopment to development. That was the key factor that they never forgot. 
the need for stability in their economy, the need for discipline over there. You look at the history of Japan, look at the history of Korea, all of them. They were very, very, and they still are up till today, extremely strict about insisting on discipline in the management of their public finances. Because when that goes to pieces, like we have seen, what, what rushed us to the IMF? What brought, took us to the IMF in 2015? A complete breakdown in the management of our public finances. We can't afford those again. So it is not just language. It is about the development of our economy. And I want that to be very clear. I've been accused of putting a glossy picture. I don't think giving the facts about what's happening in your economy is necessarily putting a glossy picture. I don't accept that description of the word at all. If the figures are wrong, tell me. Yes, because that's what you have to do. Say no, but these things that you're saying is not true. You don't have such percent this, you don't have such percent that, you don't have such percent that. The mere fact, because that, that is the way you engage when you're talking about economic argument. The figures I'm putting out, are coated, they're sugar-coated, they're not true. But not that they're glossy. I don't pay any, any glossy. I have too much respect for the people of Ghana to put glossy pictures before them. I paint for them the truth. I said I recognize that salaries and wages in our country are still too low. I said so openly. And that should tell you that I'm not talking glossy. I'm talking reality. Today, the household budget, the average household budget, is facing a declining rate of inflation. Inflation is the biggest enemy of poor people. The inflation rate in Ghana is going down all the time. We are lucky at this period too. Fuel prices are going down. Electricity prices have gone down significantly. All of these key indices, food prices in the in the pocket in the in the the budget of the Avery household has gone down significantly. People are no longer paying secondary school fees for their children. All of these are the things that are also taking place in this cry of there's no money in people's pockets. I think if most people stood back and saw their pockets, they would see that there's far more money in their pockets now than there has been for a very long time. The disconnect, clearly, Putting the economy on a strong footing, attracting the investments, and then waiting for that to impact on the standard of living and on income levels, there is always a lag. There's no economy in the world which sees that transition to be immediate. There's always a lag between the measures that are put in place to strengthen the economy and the translation of those measures into appreciable increases in, the, in wage levels and income levels. I'm very confident that if we hold firm, that translation in Ghana will occur. I don't think that there's a disconnect that is inexplicable. It's a disconnect that is very, very normal. But it will happen. I have no doubt in my mind about it. Already, as I say, <laughs> I'm sure some of you, the figures that are put out, when you look at it, you must be pinching yourself a little. Those of you who have young children, you're not paying school fees anymore. <laughs> or, or, uh, the monies are being spent on other things. <laughs> I, I hope not. <laughs> that the people in the house are still the most important people, not people outside. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, some people may want to. <laughs> Is that it? Yeah. No, so, um, as I say, these are facts. They are not imagination on my part. Fuel prices, inflation, electricity prices, uh, school fees, all of these indices, are, have been, we are giving more and more relief to the people of Ghana in the measures that we are taking. And I'm very, very confident that very soon the, the translation of that will happen. The high import duties. There's a major debate going on inside our government right now about what attitude we're going to take on the issue of duties. There's a strong lobby that is saying that we should go 
for instance, in the level of Hong Kong, Singapore, Dubai, almost no import duties, everything comes in, and, but you generate a lot of business. That argument is being made. The traditional argument that is also being made that we maintain the duty system. I'm hoping that very, very soon, the final result of that debate inside the government will be known to the Ghanaian people and where we go. But yes, I think that a high import duty system is a disincentive to economic activities, a disincentive to the purchasing power of ordinary people, and that there's therefore a clear need for every government to be very sensitive to it. I'm very sensitive to it. And as I say, a time is going to come very soon when the result of this debate inside the government will be announced. The performance of the fisheries minister. I think that was not kind to the lady. That was not kind to the lady. I think she's been doing a, a yeoman's job. It's a difficult area. Uh, I think fishermen, together with lawyers, are some of the most conservative people in the world. And getting them to change their attitudes and their habits is not easy. And we have somebody who's extremely passionate about wanting to preserve the marine stocks of our country and at the same time buy into this whole idea of clean fish, decent fish, wholesome shit, fish, rejecting dirty fish and all of that. So. The impression is given that she's at loggerheads with the fishing people, but there are many, many in that community. And one of the advantages of this ability to leave the, these premises and go out to meet people is that uh, I hear. And there are many, many different views being expressed in the fishing community. But I'm satisfied about her enthusiasm, her courage, and her determination. Because those are important qualities if you want to bring about any serious reform. If you're going along with and playing to the gallery all the time to be popular, you, ne you never get anything done. But if you have the courage of your convictions, you know what it is that you want to see. And I think all of us have an interest in making sure that the marine resources of our country are preserved, not just for us, but for the generation of people that are following us. I think that really many of you should uh, um, admire our lady. Population management. Yes, I'm a very strong admirer of the Japanese model. But we are at different stages of our development and at diff as it were at different points in time. There's, the Japanese population is declining. There are 120 million today. They're anticipating that by 2015 there will be 80 million. And going further, of course, children, people are not having children in Japan. It's virtually zero. I think it's something like 0 0.7, 0 0.7 per, per woman. That's where they are. But we are 3%. <coughs> In, in, in 60 years, when I was a boy growing up, at the time of independence, there were six million in Ghana. Accra, here, believe it or not, was a city of 250,000 people. Today is six million, 60 years later. And we are 30 million, five times. So that's a very important variable in the equation. But at the same time, the process of modernization, making sure that our women are going to school, the young girls go to school, that's a key factor, more important factor in controlling population growth than probably any other. The fact that young girls are not having children at the age of 15, but are in school at the age of 15, and maintaining school until 18 at the very least, you're postponing their whole process of of, of, of childbearing. So that's a key factor. That, and we are all in agreement that we want to make sure that all our people, men and women, and especially these Ghanaian girls who are so bright, 
Every time they compete with us, they're beating us hollow. You hear all the results that go through the schools and universities and everything. We want as many of them inside the mix as possible. It will be, over a period of time, an important contribution to slowing down the population in our country. There are other measures that, that we, ha we have to contemplate because clearly a runaway situation on the continent, and to that extent, we're not particularly different from what the rest is happening on the continent. It is being proposed that by 2050, we'll be two billion people. We'll be one in four people in the world will be African. That's how huge the demographic profile of our continent is going to be. So um, the policies that we make have to take into account. One of the reasons why I'm desperate for this economic takeoff from Ghana is that the young people, our population, the median age is 19 years, five months. Can you imagine? That's the median age of the 30 million people of Ghana is 19 years, five months. We've got to create opportunities for this young population to be able to make it and survive so that they can abandon all of this desperate search for green pastures ahead. And that requires that we manage this economy in a strong and dynamic way. Grow it quickly, expand it, let us create jobs. And that will be the contribution that we can make to the, uh, our population issue. As you modernize, as you modernize, people are at work, people are in school, it forces its own dynamic on, 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 uh, on birth uh, population growth. Now everybody knows that when it is, when uh, I hear that it's the period of the doomsday, there are a lot of children. <laughs> because at the end of the day and night, we're all twiddling our thumbs, not having too much to do. So the obvious things is what then comes up into play. But um, if we are in gainful employment and all of us are working hard, away, I think that, that we will find a way of, of bringing down the population. I think the money in their pocket thing, I've answered it. It was just the side of this question. So. Thank you, sir. We will move to the Sorry? next set of questions. Oh, one district, one stadium. Hey. <laughs> We're even having a problem with one per region. Uh, it will, <laughs> I don't want to make a promise. I think it's a good idea. I certainly think it's a good idea. One stadium, one, one modern stadium per region, I think it's a very good idea. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Mr. President, thank you. We will move through the next set of about six questions. The next is health. Um, and then, so we'll do health, education, infrastructure, sports, and creative arts. I have Mr. Bismarck Brown for health. He's registered for health. Please step up to the microphone. But, uh, uh, Minister, yes, it's, it's, uh, I have all of these very able people here. At some stage, I'll call upon them also very to well, help sir. me out. I hope nobody will object to that. Very well, sir. Okay. I have Mr. Kwejue Champon from TV Africa. He has a question in agriculture. In health or agriculture? There's a question in health here. There's another question in agriculture. So Mr. Kweje Champo of TV Africa, please join us. Let's rise up to the microphones very quickly. We have um, Kwame Adin Krebusion FM has got a question on infrastructure. So please rise up to the microphones and let's take your questions. Yes, please proceed. Merry Christmas, Mr. President. Thank you. The same to you. Thank you, sir. Mr. President, um, on the 19th of April 2015, a delegation from the Ministry of Health traveled to uh, Michigan in the United States, and they were led by um, the Director of Policy, Planning, Monitoring, and Evaluation of the Ministry, Dr. Afisa Zakaria. On their return, Dr. Zakaria filed this report I have in my hand. The main purpose of this trip was to visit some facilities in Michigan and also raise and solicit support for Ghana or for Ghana's preparedness and response to Ebola. 
they were hoping to galvanize support to build 10 regional infectious disease centers, rebuild the central medical stores facility in Tema, replenishment of medical supplies for the distribution center that was lost to the fire disaster, distribution of medical supplies, and also familiarize themselves with some proposals and some facilities there. She, in fact, Dr. Zakaria secured the buy-in of the Michigan Aerospace Manufacturers Association. And they agreed in principle to build 10 regional infectious disease centers, build and replenish a central medical store for the Ministry of Health, provide two ambulances for each of the 10 hospitals and two helicopters. Mr. President, in that report, Dr. Zakaria also indicated that the Michigan Aerospace, I'm sorry, I, if I don't build this uh, background, my question will be very meaningless. <laughs> Mr. President, my question is this. You spoke about uh, medical drones doing supplies. I am very much aware that on the 24th of August 2017, a group from the Michigan Aerospace Manufacturers Association met with you. I want to understand the status of this proposal and also what is the difference between the current drone uh, agreement we have from this very one. Thank you, sir. Mr. Dinkra, and then Mr. Tierje, you have a question listed for sports. Please uh, step up very quickly, sir. That's right. Um, good evening, Mr. President. Mr. President, I want to find out progress on the construction of a national theater for Ashanti region, for that matter, Kumasi. As we are about to celebrate Christmas, sometimes we don't have a befitting area to events, organizing events. So I want to know a progress report on your commitment to build a befitting national theater in Kumasi. Thank you, Mr. President. My question relates to the number 12 video that brought Ghana football to a standstill. I'm just wondering your core lessons from that episode and how you think going forward the relationship between the Football Association and government should be because if there was anything from that episode, it was just sometimes the nature of it and how it affects everybody. So what for you were the core lessons from it and how you intend to build a relationship between the next Football Association when elections are held and government? Thank you. Is that it? Yes, I, I have a, a major problem and liability in answering the first question. I'm not familiar with the document that you read out to me. It's contents. Where was the other one? Uh -huh. Yes, I, I'm not familiar with its contents. This is the first time I'm hearing it. I didn't know that such a a large uh, policy had been evolved in the past government. I, had no, I, I have no idea about any of the things that you're saying. And these people, when they came to see me, did not refer to that at all. Yeah, so it's difficult for me to even evaluate in terms of what is being done now and what you have in your hand. No problem, no problem. I'll, 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 all right. All right. Yeah. But is it still alive? Is the whole project still alive? I wouldn't know whether it has been brought to the... Is he here? 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 Thank you, Mr. President. I actually haven't seen that extensive document in the ministry yet, but I know about the group and a number of Ghanaians. They engaged me, I booked an appointment with His Excellency, the President. 
the people they said were coming included Bill Gates and the managing director of aerospace. When they came, there were about seven Ghanaians and one American who was neither the MD for aerospace nor Bill Gates. I got a bit disillusioned. When I went back, they also went away. Then they sent messages that they wanted to come to do sword cutting. And I told them that if they haven't demonstrated evidence of source of funding, I cannot lead them to deceive the people of this country. So they fizzled out, and I've been heard from them again. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, <laughs> sometimes, uh, sometimes, you know, you have to be careful what you ask for. <laughs> anyway, some information has been given to you. Not at all. Not at all. All right. Um, government, the progress of the National Theatre in Kumasi. Unfortunately, uh, Catherine Afiku is not here for me to. But we'll get you an answer. We'll get you an answer. I think that the fundamental arrangement that there is in the administration of football, which FIFA has, has um, implemented and adhered to all these years, is still the right one, which is that essentially football should be the responsibility of football people. And that as much as possible, governments should keep up of the administration of football. I don't, think, I, I, I don't think that too many people will quarrel with that fundamental position. But football, like any activity in the society or in the state, has to be carried out within the laws of the country. And the laws of the country, that's the responsibility of government. All the stuff that appeared on, on those videos pointing to the possibility of criminal conduct and all of that. It's not possible for a government to turn a blind eye to those things on the basis that football, this is about football. Because in that principle, you can do that compartmentalization on all aspects of, our, of, of, our, of the society's uh, activities. That, oh, this is such and such a thing, so therefore, no. If, if the law, the maintenance of law and order the respect for our laws, it's in com the compliance with, the enforcement of them. That is squarely the responsibility of government. And if that responsibility is not in any way diminished because it is in a particular area which is supposed to be a preserve of a particular group of people or a particular, and, that, and, 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 and that is not a lesson that this matter taught me. This is a lesson, this is a matter that I've always understood. What I'm hoping for out of what has happened is that through this normalization committee that the government and FIFA worked out together to establish, a new beginning in Ghanaian football administration is going to be started because the process is there for them to make a new constitution and to begin at the beginning and put in a structure that hopefully will prevent the kind of things that we have seen in the past. That is my hope, and I think it should be the hope of all of us that this game that we all adore, there's nobody in this country who loves football more than me. I'm, I'll say that as a matter of record. There's nobody in Ghana who loves football more than me. <laughs> Anyone who knows me tells me I'm a fanatic. <laughs> <laughs> so, but what the, the picture that was brought to us was not a picture that was encouraging. Something had to be done about it. And it had to be done under the responsibility of government for the maintenance of law and order in our country. And I think that that, 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 that remains constant. As I say, I'm hoping the people who have been put on this normalization committee Certainly from what I know of all of them, these are very upright, straightforward, uh, intelligent, capable Ghanaians. I think that they're going to lead the process of a more sane football administration, making rules that will be more transparent in the way things are done. 
and, and trying to balance the, the, the various interests that there are in football, the interests of we, the spectators and audience, the interests of those who put money in football, the, the interests of the administrators, the interests of the players, the clubs, or it's a, a whole bundle of things. We have to be able to find a way of linking them together. I'm hoping that it has happened elsewhere. We've seen, we're watching on television, other leagues operating. Every now and then, even they give rise to scandals. When they, those scandals occur, they're dealt with. FIFA itself, <laughs> FIFA itself. Only a few years ago, we had the issues of Blatter, the others who ran F FIFA um, and, and, and were, were, were ch chastised and sanctioned by courts of law. So the, 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 the basic premise on which FIFA runs world football, I don't quarrel with it. But at the same time, I think that this residual authority in the state to make sure that everybody in it complies with its rules, its regulations, its culture of due process must continue to be upheld. Mr. President, I want to invite Mr. Wilbur for Sasari was a question on energy, on security. Abdul Hanan from Marhaba FM has a question. Um, Mr. Gordon Asarbidi Akron from the New Crusading Guide has a question on education. <coughs> Mr. Donald Dapate has a question on politics and governance. Um, Mr. Charles Techibwedu has a question on international relations. Can we stop there? Can we just stop there? That would be the seven o'clock, especially Charles Kitchenbrook, who's, who's my good friend. Let's stop with Charles Please Kitchenbrook. Please step up to the microphone. Please step up to the microphone. Let's stop with Charles Kitchenbrook. It'll be... Let's step up to the microphone, gentlemen. Right. Good evening, Mr. President. My question is, in 2015, the Central Medical Stores in Tema was raised down by fire. Ghana lost over $8 million worth of medicine. Uh, national security had an investigation and officials were indicted. Last they were told the investigation is ongoing. What is the current status of that investigation, Mr. Mm. President? Really? Yeah. Investigation into the terrorist is it, still outstanding? Yes, please. Yes, Mr. President, there was a report on it from national security. Into the fire? Yes, please. What was the suspicion that it was arson? It was an arson, yes. It was arson, yes. deliberately. It was done. concluded that it was an arson, and the officials were named. But they have not been convicted? No, please. So the prosecution hasn't started. So it is alleged, not concluded. Concluded by national security. But not alleged. The yes. Even them, it can only be an allegation. I defer to you, sir. <laughs> yeah, but I think, I don't know whether, Mr. Minister, you know about this. Health. Oh, yes, you do. All right, fair enough. Thank uh, you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President, I, I bring you greetings from the good people yeah. in the Zungu community. My name is Abdul Hanan. I work with Marapa Media Limited. Just a stone throw from your official NIMA residence. Mr. President, my question has to do with cyber security in um, areas like the Zungu community. and the Zongo Development Fund itself. Mr. President, um, we all know what is happening regarding cybersecurity involving our young men in this country. And then the Zongo Development also came up. Um, in, in the Zongo Development Fund, we understand that we are supposed to have um, community policing. But what we understand is that the Zongo Development uh, Ministry has actually undertaken 51 projects in 41 Zungo communities in this country at a cost of uh, some 50 million Ghana cities. One five. Yeah, one five. Mm -hmm. One five. So, Mr. President, I, I'd like to hear from you um, what these projects are, because from what we know, <laughs> from what we know currently, it's only um, the AstroTef projects that are going around in some of the Zungo communities across you know, the country. So I want to find out from you with regards to the community policing in the Zungo communities and the fact that we also have issues of cybercrime 
in the Zongo community and the country at large. Thank you. Mr. President, my question has changed from energy to decentralization. Ah. The, we do know that when you were campaigning um, in 2016, you talked about the fact that district chief executives were going to be elected, howbeit the provision in the 1992 constitution which says in Article 243 that there shall be a district chief executive from every region who shall be appointed by the president. I want to know, I know some work has been going on with the issue about this election. I want to know where it is right now and what is the way forward with this issue about decentralization. I think there's a final question. Yeah, Charles Bogey. Just stand behind the microphone. <laughs> ah, he's here. Yeah, here I got you. Uh, Mr. President, good evening. My name is Donald from Belly Graphics. Sir, in your bid to establish a mission in Oslo, it, it, there, there has been some controversy. I want to find out if your government has committed any resources in purchasing any building. If yes, how much? And I also want to find out from you if you also agree to what the opposition is saying that there should be an independent inquiry into what they claim might have happened. Thank you, sir. My name is Charles Tachibu, I write for the Daily Guide newspaper. Mine is a simple one. Uh, Mr. President, we know some of your major policy initiatives have come under attack from policy think tanks and the opposition, and the opposition political parties. Would you consider revising some of these policy initiatives, including the free SHS? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I, I think that those areas where I need help, I'll bring the ministers to answer, and then I'll do the, the, the ones that I can do myself. For instance, the Tema one, I, I completely lost there. So I'll get the minister to come. Uh, as far as the number of projects in the Zongo community, the minister is also here. He'll come and give us an idea. But the cyber security, yes, um, I was astonished to hear in fact, I think it was today, the statement that in the world our, our ranking as far as cybercrime is concerned is so high that we're the fifth in the world for the commission of cybercrimes. That's a really serious matter. So we'll, I'll, I'll get the minister to come and deal with it. Um, and the, the Oslo matter. Uh, uh, is, the, is the foreign minister here? She would not allow me to answer that question. So I'll get her to come and answer. But in a minute, madam, in a minute, in a minute, yeah. So help, minister, please. The outcome of the investigation into the fire at Tema. Mustafa. Excellency. That is correct. The Central America source was men down. There was a report that I encountered when I joined the ministry. National Security Report, Fire Service Report. The National Security Report was what actually said ASI. But unfortunately for this nation, despite the fact that they have said ASI, they still indicated that there should be a forensic audit. And technically, if you go to court, any good lawyer will tell you the investigation is not complete. The Auditor General has actually taken the report. He has gone ahead to procure a forensic auditor, paid for by defeat. The report last two weeks, he, he told me, had been sent to the Attorney General's office for review, and we are waiting for that after. When did that happen? Two weeks ago. That is about three weeks now. Three weeks. From the, attorney, uh, the Auditor General. He actually commissioned um, a forensic auditor, and the work had been done. So when I actually visited the site, I couldn't find out after 2015 how we could even do a very successful forensic audit. Because three days after the fire incident, they cleared all debris, everything away, and it is like the type of football park we were playing football when we were young, no grass. 
So there was no evidence actually there. So they actually tried to cover well, evidence anyway, and they report, are working on some it. Some kind of inquiry report yes, has been, and is now with the Attorney General. Yes, so sir. we'll hear from her in due Thank course. You. Okay? All right. Um, Mr. Minister, these projects of yours, yeah. what are they? What are they about yeah. in the Zongo communities? Okay, thank you, Mr. President. Um, the 15 million cities that um, he's talking about, um, we have expended that. That also includes um, payment to the 3,000 um, Arabic teachers that you recruited to help teach in our Islamic schools um, across Zongo communities in our country. It includes the green parks, the astroturfs that you are talking about. We are also rehabilitating a number of Islamic schools in our various Zongo um, communities. We've also, I mean, sunk boreholes and wells and so on in Zongo communities that don't have water. There is a major drain in, in Asawasi, in Kumasi, which is a major Zongo community. They call it the Pelele uh, stream. And it used to flood and so on. The Zongo, under the Zongo Development Fund, we, we drained the place and now um, um, we, we've been able to get rid of the, the flooding and, and, and so on. Now, with regards to the cyber, Mr. President, what we have Before done... Before that, the community policing. Uh-huh. We don't have any program to do community policing independent of what the police service has and what the YEA have. What we have done is to ask the YEA and the Ghana Police Service to increase security for us in our Zongo communities because it's part of your vision under your uh, economic and social development program 2017 to 2024 that you say that security in our Zongo communities is your prime concern. But ours is to liaise with the existing agencies that are responsible for that matter to help us to police the place. Okay. Now, with regard to the cyber crime in Zongo communities, we have signed an agreement with um, uh, an NGO called Initiative for Youth Development, which is a NEMA-based Zongo young you know, NGO which is training for the start 200 of these young men in our Zongo uh, communities in what we call the Zongo CODES program. And we are training them, Mr. President, to identify problems and challenges in our Zongo communities and to develop software application to resolve those challenges. The idea is to channel their energies from sitting behind the computer and engaging in what is popularly called Sakawa and so on, and redirect this energy towards productive pop courses and to engineer their mind to use that technology to resolve problems in our Zulu community. We intend to do 1,000 by the end of 2020, Mr. President. Well done. Thank you, Minister. Uh, I, I think that that's a, a, a good response to your question. I see the Minister for Communications, I suspect, wants to add something. On the, on the whole cyber matter, so she's here. Thank you, Mr. President. Just to briefly reiterate the fact that we all need to be educated on safer cyber hygienic practices, and that's what the ministry does with the awareness creation programs that it um, holds. We do need to channel the energies of those who are uh, tech savvy into more productive uses of those energies, and we can do that. And that's um, exactly what the Minister for Zongo um, uh, Affairs is, is indicating that they're doing. But all of us need to know how to navigate the, the web and cyberspace in a more secure and safe manner. And the ministry will continue to in, um, incorporate sensitization, awareness creation into many of its projects. We're also building a cybersecurity center and a uh, cyber Academy. Um, hopefully this year or in the coming year we'll be able in collaboration with the Minister for Education set one up at the government secretarial school in addition to building the National Cyber Security Center. So we're on course and Ghana isn't doing too badly in the ranks of those who have prioritized cyber security as part of building their digital economies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Madam Oslo. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I'd like to assure the gentleman that we have not expended any money on Oslo on the proposed property. Indeed, 
It is not the Ministry of Foreign Affairs that will disperse the money. It's the Ministry for Finance because the Societe General loan from which any purchases for properties will come from is disbursed by the Ministry of Finance. And I can assure you that we have not even gone to PPA because it is necessary as part of the laid down procedures for us to take the proposed or the potential property to PPA. Apart from that, we have our benchmarks that we follow, which also means that we would send engineers to the property to make sure that structurally the property is sound. Apart from that, we, we, in the last uh, purchase that we did, which is uh, for Toronto, we started doing a value for money where KPMG visits the place and goes through all the documents that have been uh, provided, authenticates them, and before they come with a report. So we are nowhere near where we will advise or request Ministry of Finance to disperse any money to the seller. Thank you. So we haven't done any such thing. Not yet. Um, the business of an independent inquiry. If you will see, since we came, so many allegations are thrown against transactions, against personalities of this government, a lot of the time on the flimsiest of evidence. Here is an allegation being made I believe on the floor of Parliament, minority spokesperson on, on foreign affairs, Parliament, about a transaction that has not even taken place. And yet, a serious accusation of misappropriation, mishandling of public funds is made on a transaction that has not taken place. Assuming for the sake of argument, that the transaction had taken place. And then you were to make the allegation, oh, you paid so much, you should have, you've inflated. How can I understand? But this is a transaction that has not taken place. How then do you begin to make statements about corruption, misappropriation? And then on the basis of this bare allegation, without more, I will then say, let us have an independent inquiry. My government will never recover we will spend all our time at inquiries because it clearly is the pattern of the opposition to throw these accusations in the air. When they're debunked, you don't hear anything about it, they just move to the next allegation. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what we have seen. These allegations are made, they're found to be empty. There's not so much a word as, oh, okay, we're sorry about that. No, we just move on and fabricate the next one and it'll go on and it's gonna get worse. 2019, a year to the election of these people who are so desperate, it's going to get worse. The fabrications will continue and continue. I, I think that for us, for a government, a president, to say he's going to acquiesce for an, in, an inquiry, you need to have some solid, some base that raises what the law, the lawyers call some kind of prima facie case. But in that case, I think the president is duty bound to say, yes, let this matter be investigated. But when you have allegations that are so empty of substance, and then you say that merely because it has been raised, you therefore have to have an independent inquiry. I know that it will be in the interest of some people to make sure that we don't work, and we just get ourselves entangled in all of these red herrings and everything. So before you know it, 2020 is there, you say, ah, these characters, they came and said this and this to you. They have not even been able to do this. I'm not going to buy that. And I'm not going to do that. We're going to stay focused. If somebody comes and brings a serious allegation that is worth investigating, I am the first to accept it. I've done it already in my government. I'll do it again, but not on things like this. The um, election of DCEs. A program has been put. We have a problem about taking the whole hog of party political 
contests into local government. I believe that is where now the vast majority of us wanted to go. We don't just want to have an election, but we want to have an election in which it is also on a party basis at the local level. There's an article of the Constitution, Article 55, which is an entrenched clause of the Constitution, which prohibits the sponsorship of elections to local government office on the basis of partisan or party political affiliation. So that has to be removed before we can have the elections that all of us are contemplating. And I felt that in the we're looking at costs and convenience and everything. The local government elections that are coming this year, we will tag the referendum onto it. Already we're having a referendum this year on, in, in a week's time on these uh, uh, regions. Next year we're due to have district assembly elections. My own feeling is that, and th this referendum is limited. It's limited to the six regions. But the referendum over Article 55 is a national one, just as the elections for district assembly elections is a national one, that it will be make, make more sense, it will be less costly to the taxpayer if the two, the referendum to decide whether or not we want party politics and local government goes along with the district assembly elections. And then from, if the answer is yes, the clause is amended, and then from then onwards, we will be able to have the district assembly, uh, district chief executives being elected on a partisan basis. So that is um, very much on course. I believe the minister of local government, the minister of local, for local government, has actually publicly made the statement that I'm making now that there will be a referendum. She has even began the process in Parliament, uh, the bill for the amendment of the constitution is before the Parliament now. The first reading has. Ah, so the whole process has begun. The first reading in Parliament for the advice of the Council of State and then the gazetting, and then it'll come back, I think, for a, sec a second reading. Is it? Bef no, it'll then go to a referendum. It'll go for the first reading and then to the second. Yeah, the referendum before then we get it. So the, the process has begun. So I'm, I'm, I'm very, being very scrupulous about my uh, commitments. Uh, there's some people, they don't want to realize it. They say, I'm failing in all my commitments. But one by one, I'm fulfilling all of them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what about the attacks by the think tanks and the opposition on policies? Is there a right? This is what we have all fought for for a long time, an open society that allows everybody to express their views on government policy, develop alternative views, support, as the case may be. But one thing that is becoming clear to me is that it seems that every step that we want to take to modernize our society, to initiate the process of transformation, is met with resistance by our opponents. Digitization, paperless ports, uh, national ID card, the, uh, of course, free senior high school education. All of these steps that are being taken to take our country into the 21st century are being resisted by the opposition. I know some people have a vested interest in backwardness, in keeping people, <laughs> in keeping people ignorant and backward, because they can then manipulate them easier. The Ghanaian people and myself, we're both in a hurry to get to the 21st century. And we're going to go and go and go and go and turn. So as far as I'm concerned, these matters, these are policies that are, are the subject of attack, their rights, the think tanks and whatever. Many of the think tanks too, many of the, the bombs they throw turn out to be very damp squads. At the end of the day, they, they have very little substance to them. Uh, it's their, their right. I'll be the first to say that it is their right to open their mouth and say what they want. But they're not going to deter me. They're not going to deter this administration from continuing the path of bringing modern instruments of governance, attitudes towards governance, 
and bringing the economic initiatives that will take Ghana to be a full and active member of this 21st century. It is time that we made this collective effort to go forward. Our country, we have a history that really should condemn us. What has happened in some recent generations? This is the first country. The 19th century already, people were going to school in Ghana at a time when virtually the entire continent of Africa, there were no schools. We were the first to initiate the movements for freedom. The, South, the Southern and Eastern Africans are caught in the web of the sequestration of their lands by the colonial power. At the end of the 19th century, Saba, in the case of the Hayford, Say and J.P. Brown and all these people got together in Cape Coast, roused the people of Ghana to resist any attempt to take over our lands. They succeeded. That is the history from which we come. That in the 20s and 30s, nationalist movements were taking place in West Africa, all of them being inspired by events in our country. In 1947, when the United Cocos Convention was launched, it was the first nationalist movement that was launched in the whole of, 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 of sub-Saharan Africa. So this is our history. Then in 1957, the icing on the cake, Kwame Nkrumah raised the flag of our country. It's the first nation to get freedom. We have a huge history, and we have a responsibility to ourselves and to that history to move this country to the 21st century. That's the, that is, for me, the linchpin and the anchor of everything that I'm doing. Nothing is going to divert me from that past. We'll go ahead and we'll succeed. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. President, we thank you for your time and for taking these questions. I want to invite the Honorable Deputy Minister for Information, uh, Pio Senam Hajide, to say our proper thanks. And then we'll take a closing prayer and the national anthem and depart. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. We are grateful to God Almighty for how far he has brought this country. Without a the, without the doubt, the good Lord has given us a leader and a leadership that is engaged in emancipating this country from the legacy burden and legacy servitude that was inherited and is leading us towards the promised land. Mr. President, the people of Ghana are grateful to you for keeping your commitment of keeping them in the governance process, running a transparent and open administration, and by allowing them to engage with you through the people uh, of the media. And this is the second time within one year, apart from your several interaction across the various regions that you have engaged with the people of Ghana through the media, the people are grateful, Your Excellency. Your Excellency, the Vice President, the Chief of Staff, the Senior Minister and Ministers, we are grateful to you for taking time of your very, very busy schedules to join us this evening as His Excellency once again demonstrates that he is a man of the people and he wants to govern and lead from the front and that he is prepared to account to the people on all the marvelous things that are happening in this country. We are grateful to the Ghana Journalists Association, the leadership, President Afemoni and, and your group. We are grateful for your partnership. We are grateful to Giba and Primpag for your uh, partnership and collaboration with the ministry and with the communications directorate to put this together. The invitations were coordinated by you. You helped us to design the ground rules that we applied here today. We are grateful uh, to our stakeholders. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the media, we are very, very grateful to you. Uh, it is through you and with you that we carry this country along with us. All the good things that are happening in this country, we expect that through you, the people of Ghana will come along with us and they will understand that change is actually happening. Uh, we are grateful to the general citizenry, the good people of Ghana, for taking time off 
uh, we are aware and our social media handles are indicating it to us that several millions of the Ghanaian people, Your Excellency, took time off to listen to you and to watch you. Uh, we are grateful to the people of Ghana for joining us in this exercise. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are grateful to everybody. God bless you and God bless the homeland. Thank you. I want to invite Alaji Gomda to say a Muslim prayer for us as we close and then we'll take the national anthem and depart. Shall we please rise? with the president, uh, we have to express gratitude to Almighty Allah, Almighty God. For in the Islamic uh, scriptures, we are told that when God shows such benevolence, you should be thankful to him so that he will give more to you. We ask him to give us more. And uh, on this note, I will invoke this powerful, the most important uh, chapter of the Holy Quran, uh, the Fatiha. I will render it in Arabic. Uh, it has therapeutic values. Bismillah rahman rahim Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Ar-Rahman rahim maliki yawm bid-deen. Iyaka na'abudu wa iyaka na'usta'een. Idina sirat al-mustaqeem sirat al-lazina anamta alayhim. Ghayri al-maghdubin alayhim wa al-dhaleen. And you say, Amin. Amin. Thank you. The National Anthem.